G'day there, you're watching the Aussie BIM Guru and uh, today we're going to be running through a tutorial in Autodesk Revit. Um, so previously I did a session of family tutorials um, about planning, building and uh, applying parameters and graphical settings to families. If you're quite new to families in Revit, I advise that you probably watch these videos first. Um, but without further ado, we'll go on to the, today's technique, which is using parametric arrays, um, which is an advanced technique in my opinion. So we're going to be using the array tool today. So if you're not overly familiar with it, it creates basically a repeated element in a straight line or a circle um, of a set count and spacing. And you can see where it is located on the ribbon down here. So the golden rule for parametric arrays um, is that if the array array element is parametric itself, so if it has a parametric width, depth, height, etc., I always advise that you avoid creating an array out of a native geometric element, such as an extrusion and instead use a nested component where possible. So for example, I'd build a nested step in a step ladder rather than doing an extrusion because it's quite hard to constrain those elements once they're in an array. So we're gonna look at some methods today. Um, so the first one we're gonna look at is a very basic one. It's basically a fixed module um, that where the user defines how many things they want and the length is a consequence of that. So there's a lot of examples of how this could be done. So the one that we're gonna look at today as an example, is a bank of lockers, but there's lots of applications for this. So I'll show you each time how to do each one of these. So we've got a set of, a set of families as examples. So this one's just a locker. And I'm just gonna make a new family, which will be the host for my array. So arrays themselves are families. Um, I don't usually advise trying to do an intelligent array at the project level. So usually I'd use a generic model. So we'll just take that family and load that in to our array and place one of them. So ideally this is gonna be our origin. So the, probably I'd usually make this left if we're arraying to the right. And I'd make that back in this case. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start an array. So we're just gonna click once across and you get this line here that basically says how many elements you want. And you can actually associate a parameter to that. And usually we call this count or something like that. And we'll just make it instance based. Count is always an integer. So basically now I've got a parameter that I can change that will change the number of counts. The next thing we need to do is actually put our elements at the right spacing. So we need to align our first element and then we need to align our second element. So usually I advise that you create reference planes to you to align those and just make that not a reference. So in this case, the locker is a fixed size. So we can align once here, and you'll note that the array will start directing itself based on that. Usually from there, it's good to make a parameter on the end that will tell you how long the overall array is, even though it's a consequence. So we're gonna make a parameter called width. Um, we could use a shared parameter if we so wanted to. So let's just make a dimension parameter of width, and that will be instance-based. Likewise, our array count is instance-based, and basically it is five times 300 in this case, sorry, count by 300. And that will make this the right parameter each time. And that's, that's quite simple. So from there, this would basically be a family that we could load into a project and we could use an array based on this family. So I'll load this in. And the way this family will work is that I can change my width if I want but it will always snap to the nearest increment of 300. But typically it'll be better just to take how many you want. Um, but because those parameters are connected, it will always find the nearest possible, nearest possible snap as you drag that along as well, just an inbuilt behavior of connecting that formula. You can also do a different type of array, so which is quite similar. So that's what I call method 1B. And this one will be built so that you can drag it to the exact length you need it to be but the array will instead only go to the actual number it can provide and it will leave excess behind where it remains. So what I can do to do that instead is use a formula. And I can basically say that length is driven by a formula now. So I'll say uh, this will need to be what I use to control this and count will actually be different. So we can always add a parameter called spacing as well if you want that to be controlled a bit more intelligently. And I can say this is controlled by that as well, just in case we want to change our spacing. So we're gonna make this our, our width over our spacing. Um, and then we're gonna round down as a formula. So 
So essentially what happens if I go over a particular range, you'll notice that my array doesn't get any wider. So you end up with a bit of excess. But if I bypass a certain point where a new module can be accommodated, it will add it. So if I load that in as a copy over the top, you will notice this, this family will behave a little bit differently now. So as I have enough room for modules, they'll enter into the array, which is quite simple. So that's, um, that's quite a, a basic array, I'd say, but still the most essential one that you might use. Um, the next method is basically the same thing, but instead of constraining the corner, we're actually constraining something upon its center line. Um, so the length again is consequential, but it's a flexibly spaced module. So in this case, we're actually setting the spacing of the element and the count. So an example of how this could be done is uh, say a, ba a bank of urinals. So if we just take that array family and we just get rid of all this content. Uh, so what we'll need now is the spacing will be an instance based parameter. And we'll just remove this formula. Count is going to be an instance based parameter as well set by the user and length will be a consequence of that. So it will be count times spacing. And if we just load in again, another family that we can use in this case, we'll just get a, a urinal family. We can place that as the first element and then array it from there. So if I do that and then array, so I'll constrain this to the first, constrain that to the second. And then I'll associate this to the count parameter. And what we can do is actually make this take one. So what we really want that to be is count take one by spacing. Because the first element isn't, isn't counted as a spacing. And that will parametrically tie those together. So you can see then if we say we only want four and we want them to be at 700, You'll see the array figures itself out based on those parameters. So if I load this one over the top again, you'll see this one's quite straightforward. And unlike the other one, it won't let us set the width uh, similarly. So what we can say in this case is that we want five at 700 or five at 500. And each time it will rationalize it into, into the required amount that you need. Um, you could also likewise take out the first one and do an array from the first object to the end instead. That way you always have an incest spacing from your first urinal. So that's an example of how another one can be done. Um, method type three is a little bit more complicated. So this is where you will define how many you need. Um, you'll define the length, but something will be stretched to fill that space instead. This is a more common type of array for things like joinery elements, um, cubicles, etc. Um, so we might we might actually not do shelves and drawers. Actually, we'll do toilet cubicles because that one's a little bit easier to work with. And it's a much more common uh, use for arrays as well. So let's just say that our array is going to be spaced at 900. So we'll just say our spacing is 900 in this case, but our spacing will be consequential. So what we're actually going to do is set our length and our count. And we're going to say that our spacing is this over count. This way, this is always a consequence of what we choose it to be. So we can say five, and you can see then the spacing knows what it needs to be to be a fifth of this. And then what we can do is just load in our cubicle family. And we can array this. And what we're gonna to need to do in this particular case is we're actually gonna to need to set the width to a parameter. So this is why I always recommend nesting a family. Sorry, I need this to be spacing. So this is why I always recommend nesting a family instead. It's so much easier to work with. And what we might do in the case of this family as well is actually set up a depth parameter as well so that the user still has control over that in their project. And from there, our count is five. And likewise, all we need to do from there is just constrain our toilet to the right position. And that's quite easy. And if you needed a toilet to be in that array as well, that's quite easy. So we need to set up a second reference. Sorry. Second reference for the next spacing. 
And the only reason we're doing that is because we need to have a center on each one of these. So if I just make that EQ, that will give me a centric constraint. That will also mean relative to the array. And then we can load in a toilet. And likewise, we can set that to an array as well. So we can array this across, associate the count. And then constrain the toilet to that centric reference plane as well. So we're going to constrain the toilet. It's always good to make sure you constrain the right thing. So you want to constrain them to reference planes, not to geometry. And there you go. So if I load that into my project again, basically I'm setting the target for how many of these I need. Obviously that's not a very logical distribution, but you can see as I stretch this out, so will all these modules, modules update in width as well. And because I nested my depth, I can sort of set that as well, similarly. Uh, at the same time, I can say my, my width is 3000 and I need three cubicles, uh, three, Thousands. And there you go, I get three meter wide cubicles as a result. So that's quite a good way to do it. Um, but there's an alternative way of looking at this type of array, which is to say that sometimes we actually have a maximum or a minimum that we're trying to achieve in this case. So we're going to say in this case that our minimum toilet size is 900 in width. Um, and the, the array will fill this based on how many it can possibly fit. Um, so in this case, we'll revisit our toilet cubicle family and we'll just go back into it and instead we're going to change the count field to be independent so the spacing is going to be uh i guess consequential so the, the the spacing is going to be that over count uh, sorry and we're going to control the width and that's all we're going to control this is going to be driven by a formula so what we're going to do is add a minimum width as a type parameter and let's say that that's 900 so in this case we're going to basically divide this by minimum width and we're going to round up and that's so that we always provide the bare minimum required uh, sorry Got to make sure I type my parameter out properly. Minimum width. There we go. So you'll see in this case that it will only give me enough so that it's it's meeting the minimum compliant level that it has. So at the moment it's giving me an even amount of six. However, if I was going to go to 5300, it would give me. Uh, no, sorry, that's not correct. My bad round down is actually the right way to go and this way it will only give me the amount that can possibly reach a whole number based on this so as i get closer to my next i guess compliant increment it basically will wait until we have the right amount to meet the requirement for four cubicles so if i went to 3700 for example then in that case i can achieve this but if i went to 35 it goes to three so that means that this is always going to be compliant, um, but achieving the maximum amount possible in the length that we provide. So instead now you'll see as I change this in size, the array knows how many it can add to fill that space. So it's much more dynamic and you can lock, lock it into, I guess, achieve um, minimum standard requirements. So much more intelligent. So this is probably the most common type of array I'll use in plan. And obviously what we've been doing is fine if you're just working in floor plan. You can also do arrays in um, elevation as well. So let's just build a really basic shelf component. Um, we'll just build a generic model. And we'll just give it a, a width and a depth. And this will be just a, a shelf for a cupboard or something like that. And if I'm building a component for a, um, an array, I always use shared parameters where I can, um, but it's not overly important. It doesn't necessarily need to use shared parameters. 
some of those I find it easier because it makes them common to the system that I work in. So we're just going to constrain an extrusion. One, two, three, four. And then we'll just make sure that it's got a, a height as well. So we'll do zero down to negative 30. And then I'll just go and constrain that as well to reference planes. We'll just make that the bottom of our shelf. Great. And then we'll give that a height or a thickness. And you can make these type based or instance based. It's up to you. It just depends whether you have one copy of this or multiples with different values. Um, typically I make them instance based, but you can make them type based um, if you're just using one common size. And sometimes it's good to nest in a material parameter as well, because otherwise you won't be able to actually give it a material once it's in use in an array family. Great. So what we'll do from there is we'll just make, we'll just save this. And we'll just make this a shelf component. So if we just make a new family, and this would be, I guess, the level that we're doing the array at. Metric casework. So what we'll do is we'll take that shelf and we'll load that into our family. And we'll just place one copy of that. And what I might do is just make it work plane based as well, just so it's easier to associate it to a particular plane in the family level, which is something I commonly do in most of my family. So what we can do at this level is before we array it, we can just assign a few common dimensions. So we're gonna make it width and depth. And now these are controlled and you'll see these go to nodes, which means they're basically being locked into something. So I can just say shelf thickness. Great. And if I go to my front view in elevation, I can basically set my height to say 2100. I'll have to do it at the type level. And what we're going to do is say that our array is basically going to be our first shelf and our second shelf up to the point where there is one shelf remaining. We don't actually need this reference plane to be here, but I'm just going to add it here so, so you can sort of understand what's happening. Sorry, I need to make those individuals. So what we're going to do is associate a parameter to each of these spacings. So we're just going to say shelf spacing. And in this case, let's just say the user wants to elect how many shelves they have. So I'll just pick this shelf to go on the first shelf work plane. And instead I'm going to write array up instead. So I'll just say number of shelves is my parameter. And this can be instance. Okay, I think I made my shelf spacing instance based as well. Yes. Great. So we need to vertically lock our shelves. And we need to horizontally lock our shelves. I always recommend locking to the origin of the component. That way you're confident that it's not going to try and pull itself away from its origin when it moves. Okay, so at the moment we have two shelves in principle. But now we need a formula to tell, tell us how to fill that casework. So we're going to make a formula, which is basically going to be the height. So the number of shelves is elected by the user. Um, but the height, the height over the shelf spacing will be what we want. Um, so shelf spacing is height over number of shelves. However, we want to make it plus two because we have an alcove at the top and the bottom. Sorry, height over number of shelves plus two. And you'll see that will give us equally spaced, sorry, plus one, one, that's right, there we go. So now if I have four shelves, you'll see that I get equally spaced four shelves. My bad, it was plus one, sorry, because the first shelf is already counted. That way we have a void at the top and the bottom. Um, in this case, you may run into an issue which I commonly have to solve, which is where a user will say, I only want one shelf, and your family will break because an array can't be any less than two. So let's go to our absolute minimum in this case. And what we're gonna need to do is make the actual count of shelves overridden. So this is a parameter that we're not gonna control anymore. And we're gonna make the user's input again, 
as an integer. So this is the one that the users will control. And in this case, it's going to be a formula that says, if that is less than two, make it two, otherwise make it that parameter. And what this will do is this will protect our parameter essentially. So if we have two shelves, if we have less than two, it will be that, but otherwise it will allow us to do this. But the problem that happens now is I want one shelf. Well, actually what's happened there is I've got two. So I'm not too happy about that. So instead what we're gonna do is that shelf spacing is gonna have to be driven by a different formula as well. So we'll just go to number of shelves three and we don't have to worry about our last shelf anymore. So really what we're gonna do is have an override for shelf spacing as well. Um, and we're gonna make it so that they can't say zero shelves as well. So in this case, we're gonna work under the assumption that the shelf spacing will be half of the height or it will be this. So in this case, what we're gonna do is have another shelf that's not a part of the array. And we're gonna assign a visibility parameter to the ones on the array. So this will be shelves more than, than more than one. Okay, and the way this parameter is gonna work is it's gonna know if number of shelves is greater than two, is greater than one, sorry, then we know that this is the set of shelves we want. So if we go down to one shelf, technically at the family level, we won't have any shelves at the moment. And then what we do is we'll take one of these, we'll ungroup it, and then we'll make this shelves, shelves one. Okay. And then we'll reconstrain this. And we'll just check what height that shelf is at as well. Okay, so we actually want that to be at this height. Just make sure this is actually Okay, so we want it to be zero, and then we want to constrain that to the back. And then we're going to change our rule for shelf spacing as well. So shelf spacing will be if shelves more than one, then it will be the original formula we had. Otherwise, it will be height on two. This way, when our array is one shelf, we'll have one shelf in the middle. Uh, actually, I need to fix that. Shells more than one, number of shells one. Shells one, so I need to say that this is for when shelves, shells not shells more than one, sorry. So number of shells has to be less than two, okay. So then that shelf will be on in that case and your array will be hidden at the family level essentially. So that's how you can safeguard, I guess, a set of shelves. And obviously if the user makes their set of shelves zero, the formula will still detect and make this half. So nothing will break. And then your one will turn off and your two will also turn off. But this way you protect yourself. So you can have a set of five and it will work. And your single shelf will be off and your main shelf will be on. So that's just how you can set up quite an intelligent um, array uh, as well. Uh, so I'll just load that in and quickly show that that works as well. Let's jump into 3D. Isolate this element. And you'll see that as I change the number of shelves I have from one, two, three, uh, 12, it fills it out to the array perspective as well. And obviously we could change height as well and the array would know how to deal with that. So if we suddenly had a uh, 3000, our array can handle that, that change in height because all the formulas are based upon that. So that's how you can do it in a vertical aspect as well. Um, and it's important to know that, you know, this can be applied in all directions, X, Y, Z, as long as you're arraying in one direction. But that brings us to our last method, which is a bit more complicated. And that is, I guess, a user-defined height and depth or a two-directional array. So basically something on an angle in, in principle. So the module is stretched to fill and the count is determined by, again, a maximum module width. And the perfect example of this um, is a stepladder. I have an example here of a stepladder where we've used a two-directional array. And I'll sort of run you through the workflow and the logic that I've used 
So in principle, within this ladder, we have a nested component for the step, um, the same way that we worked with our shelf. So, sorry, I'll go to the family instead. Okay, so you'll see here, this is actually the arrayed component and essentially it's a step family. Um, so it has a, a width, depth and height that have been constrained in the same way. Um, we're not worrying about going less than two in this case, because a step ladder wouldn't really be much of a ladder with one step. And essentially we've worked from the top down because we want the ladder to finish on a step down to the bottom where there would be one step and then the base. So the way this family is set up is that basically the depth is determined by trigonometry. So the height is set by the user and the angle is set by the user. So the depth is consequential. So what we've done is we've actually constrained our first step at the top and then we've arrayed our next step down with a offset but then we've got two offsets basically. So we're arraying in two directions for our next step. And essentially we're using formulas to determine uh, where that next step should be placed. So I'll run you through how those formulas would work. So essentially we need to figure out our step count first. So we have a maximum tread height of 240 in this case. So we're rounding up basically, and we're dividing our height by that maximum height and then rounding up to find the, the I guess the minimum number of steps to achieve a maximum height in this case, so that we don't exceed a uh, tread height uh, reach. So we could say 250, for example, as well. And we've got a 2.5 high ladder. So in this case, we have 10 steps to achieve that, um, or 10 spaces. And because our array is starting at the top, we don't need to add or take one from this array, unlike some of the other ones where we had spaces at the bottom and the top. Uh, from there, we need to look at the spacings. So the spacing for Y, is quite easy. It's just the height over the number of steps in this case. Um, spacing X is a little bit more complicated. Um, so we use trigonometry in this case to reverse engineer and find out the depth. So for those that are familiar with trigonometry, you'll sort of understand how this formula is derived. Um, but in principle, really quickly is we're trying to find this dimension. We know, sorry, we're trying to find this dimension. And we know this dimension. So that's how we can figure it out from there. And that's how we place our step on the next one. Um, so we know our angle, we know our, we know our height. So we need 10 to find this one. Um, I won't teach you trigonometry now because it's something you should probably look at separately. But we basically use trigonometry in a formula to determine that. So as we change the, the angle of our ladder, all of those will recalculate to determine. So you can see that spacing is being redetermined in each case as we go. Uh, it looks like I probably need to redetermine the spacing and the constraint here, but in principle it would work if I constrain the top of that ladder correctly. Um, so that's the only tweak I need to make. Um, but it's probably better to watch my fourth family tutorial to have a look at how you can work with angles in families. Uh, but basically in principle, very approximately as I change the angle of this ladder, you'll see that it will readjust to suit. So if I go to 80 degrees, and I change my height to three meters, it redetermines the spacing and re recalculates the array of steps. So that's how a two-dimensional array would work. Um, the, the key here is just to use both the spacing in one direction and the spacing in the other with formulas. And you always have one dimension that's determined by another. Um, the alternative is that you set the depth and the height and the angle is consequential instead, um, which can be more practical in some scenarios. Uh, so in principle, that's the, probably the more complex workflow with parametric arrays. Um, so we've covered a lot of techniques here, uh, but practice always makes perfect. Um, these are all things that you'll find difficult the first few times you do them, and eventually they become second nature when you're doing content creation with parametric arrays. Um, so if you've got any questions or queries or uh, comments, um, feel free to leave them down below. And um, hopefully you enjoyed this workflow and you got something out of it, and I'll see you on the next one. Thanks. Take care. Bye.